I'm here today, well, let me say, um, Fintan's introduced me. I'm a product UX consultant, hybrid person, um, specializing in IoT. Um, I have a particular focus on, making thing, on, on creating things that are valuable, make sense, and are usable to, to sort of mass market audiences. Um, now, I've been recently researching failures in IoT from a user perspective. Um, now, I, I kind of have a sense that perhaps I'm the third person to be, to be starting to talk about this today, so I apologize for any repetition. Um, I've, I've knocked a couple of examples out and replaced them with other things because Alistair stole them earlier, um, <laughs> which is a, lack, a complete lack of O'Reilly solidarity there. Thank you. Um, so, but I'm going to try and frame this around some constructive design principles for mitigating the impact of failures on, on users. Okay, so, and I'm not going to be talking about security uh, or privacy, um, both in hugely important issues, um, or even things of kind of dubious ethics that perhaps you know, function as expected, but, but perhaps cause harm to particular social groups, because that, that's also quite an important category of, of failure, but that's a topic for a beer if you want to talk to me, if you want to talk to me later. Now, I went looking for the first, you all know Murphy's Law, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Um, and I, I kind of went looking for the origins of this, and I found this, this sort of first written example that I thought was rather interesting. Um, you probably can't read it at the back, I apologise. I thought we were going to have a bigger screen. Um, but this is from a guy called uh, Alfred Holt, who was writing about steam shipping in 1878. Uh, and he said, it is found that anything that can go wrong at sea generally does go wrong, which you've probably all heard in one shape or form. The human factor cannot be safely neglected in planning machinery, you know, yay UX and all that. Uh, and the thing I really like is he said, if attention is to be obtained, the engine must be such that the engineer will be disposed to attend to it, i.e. somebody's got to perceive that it's kind of worth their while and in their interest to actually bother with this stuff, which, um, which uh, kind of links into tangentially some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, sorry, Miley. Um, but the, 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 the essential problem with failure in, in IoT is that it's giving us, in putting, physical, putting computing in the physical world um, really gives us more and more ways in which software can act on the physical world and vice versa. You know, yay, that's brilliant. Um, what that means is that more and more things can now go wrong, both in classic mechanical sort of breaking ways, uh, but also in gnarly complicated software ways. So they can have bugs and glitches. They can be essentially never finished, shipped with an expectation that there will be things wrong with them and those things will hopefully get fixed over, fixed over time. Um, you know, and also all connected to each other. So a problem with one thing can have a knock-on effect on other things and systems and, and on and on it goes. Um, so essentially, in a way, we've, we've really made things difficult for ourselves and they've kind of given us the both, worst of both worlds. Now, my, my taxonomy of things that can go wrong, uh, I won't list lots of examples here because you're, you're all people who are quite well embedded in this industry and, and, uh, you know, and, and will know some of these things I'm talking about. Um, but essentially, I think there are, let's say, five classes of problem here. Uh, there are device issues, things can break, mechanics can break, mechanical parts can break, electronics can break. Uh, they can develop uh, embed firmware or, or software problems that cause them to, to stop working, um, and they can lose power. Then there are network and service issues. Things can always lose connectivity. Many of them are actually intended to not necessarily be connected all the time. Um, and people's services can go down. So you know, cloud services go down, people's servers stop working, other people's servers stop working. Then there are business issues. These are kind of changes in business circumstance. And we've heard, we've heard about Revolve twice already today. Um, I was going to talk about Revolve. I will now talk about something else. Um, but this is essentially what happens when a business decides that it is no longer in its interest to keep maintaining a service. Uh, and therefore, the products that depend on that service uh, stop working. Then there are user issues. People make mistakes, uh, genuine mistakes. Sometimes they do very reckless or stupid things like flying drones near power lines or airports, that kind of stuff. There's a human factor in here, and to a certain extent, we have to try and anticipate these, uh, anticipate these things and deal with them. And then there's a really kind of fun category of, of real world issues. And these are things that happen when you know, perhaps the product is, is working as you, as you expected it to, or it's doing what you wanted it to do. Um, but you know, something about the real-world conditions under which it's operating has either changed uh, or just isn't appropriate for, for, the, way that it's, for the way that it's set up. Um, and because I'm kind of short on time here, I'm doing a longer version of this of, 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 of talk around the same topic in a couple of days at a design conference. But um, I'm going to try and be constructive and structure this around some, some suggestions for how we can how we can mitigate this. The first one of these is that product value must outweigh potential risks. Now, some of these are going to sound really obvious and glib. And when I went back and looked at them, I was like, well, of course, that's obvious. Well, you would think it would be. Apparently, it isn't to everybody. Has anyone read uh, William Gibson, The Peripheral? 
one. Oh, few ha few hands. Do you remember the weaponized Russian buggy with the self-targeting swarm weapons? No, uh, well, this doesn't have those. No, no, that's really that's really cool. This kind of isn't quite as cool. This is a this is a smart bee stroller or buggy as we, we call them around here. Um, its selling point. This, these guys were raising money recently on um, crowdfunding. They got eighty five thousand dollars, which doesn't sound like very much money for developing one of these. But anyway, um, this is uh, the the selling point of this thing is that it moves without you having to push it. So you walk towards it and it and it and it kind of moves ahead of you. So you have your hands free for things like waving them when you're running and using your phone and stuff. Now, I don't know how many of you are parents. Um, entirely possible that non-parents can relate to this as well. Um, but the idea of something that, that sort of one of the worst things about buggies, one of the most worrying things about buggies is the thought that, that they might, the brakes might fail, they might roll down, they might roll away from you, you might lose, lose them, you know, lose, you know, let go of them on a hill and they might run away into traffic. You know, it is not the fact that you have to use your hands, it is the fact that you want to retain control of it, which is, which is most significant. Um, and I would suggest, also, it has a heater and it has some kind of anti-theft lockdown mode, which sounds, really, sounds a bit like the, the, the kind of Russian weaponized thing, which maybe that's cool. But I think the, the point for me, and I might, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but the point here is that the marginal benefit of this thing, of not being able to, of not have, having to, being able to have your hands free, is far outweighed for me by the risk that this thing is going to run away. And if I run towards it, it's going to move further and further away from me. And that's just, you know... I don't think $85,000 is, is going to be enough money to, to, uh, to uh, tackle all those safety problems. So the second one, um, and this again is beginning to feel like a bit of an IoT hoary old cliche to me, um, is around designing systems to tolerate lost connectivity. I'm sure many of you technical people have thought about this um, in many situations. Um, and I left PetNet in here because I think this is, this is, this is quite, a, quite a crazy example. Um, if you have a product which and people are used to, particularly in a consumer setting, people are used to having a sort of ancestor of that product that's not connected, and you make a connected thing that can fail in worse ways than the non-connected thing, that's not going to fly, I don't think. Um, and so PetNet, um, as Alistair was talking about, PetNet, PetNet's servers went offline, or actually apparently, as they said, somebody else's servers went offline uh, for, uh, for 12 hours, meaning that pets were not going to get fed. Um, if you're going to make a pet feeder, you know, does it really, should there's something like that that's really important really be depending on the cloud? Um, and the other thing, and I, I borrowed this example from Stacey's podcast. Thank you, Stacey. Um, this, is the, this is the idea around designing for intermittent connectivity. Now, you know, we're all familiar with things like smart meters that, you know, may, if they can't always connect to send data, we'll, we'll buffer it and send it later. Um, what I think is quite nice about this, uh, about this Brita Infinity Jug, and it's, it's not, you know, this is not a life-changing product, but it's quite, it's quite an elegant little piece of thought that's gone into this. Um, it doesn't try and connect, what it, what it does, sorry, is, is kind of track your usage of filters and, and, and automatically order replacements via, via Amazon Dash. Um, but what it does is it doesn't sort of sit there trying to connect and send data, you know, all the time. Most people keep things like this in a fridge, which is a big metal box in your kitchen. Imagine most of you know that the chances of getting a radio signal through a big metal box are, are not brilliant. Um, so it connects and sends data when you fill it, which is also, you know, indicates when it's empty, when you want to be carrying on using it. Um, you know, and, uh, and it's, out of the, you know, it's out of the fridge and you've tipped it up and there, there are lots of ways they could, several ways they could be sensing that. So that's kind of just an elegant use of, of that. Um, another one, I, like to, I do like to bang on about this. I probably banged on about it at ThingMonk last year and probably, probably the time I spoke before that. Um, and Haiyan talked a little bit about this as well. The idea that sort of chain, what seem like small differences in responsiveness can have a massive impact on user experience. Um, and I want to talk about um, appropriate and inappropriate latency here. Um, responsiveness of a product, whether that's the time between you, essentially the time between you asking it to do something and it responding, uh, and you know, and the amount, also the amount of feedback that you get that it's happening, is is not just a user experience issue. Sometimes it's a kind of fit for purpose kind of product value issue. Um, this is a this is a, a ring doorbell, um, and uh, I am reliably informed that these things, at least in their first version, took about 20 to 30 seconds to uh, connect to the network and then connect to the cloud service in order to pass a message to the to the to the, to the owner to tell them there was someone at the door. Now, 20 or 30 seconds, if someone comes to your door and presses on the buzzer, particularly if they're a courier who's got places to be and kind of needs to get off to the next thing, is long enough 
for them to think that you're out, for them to give up, which is kind of really defeats the object of, of bothering to have a connected doorbell. So I know it's hard, it can be very difficult, we don't always know how long it's gonna to take to get a message across a network, but making things work quickly and giving people good feedback that, they're actually, that they are actually working and they just need a bit more time um, is really, really important. Um, the next one is about defaulting to a safe state. If you're going to fail, at least fail in a way that doesn't cause put user in danger. Uh, now, as I said, this is going to be totally impossible for you to read, I apologize, but this is a, a really nice example I found of someone who is, who, is cre who is hacking together her own artificial pancreas to manage her diabetes. Um, and this is uh, what she's, she's taken a lot of um, thought quite hard about what happens if some, the data that the, that the insulin pump receives, if some of those data points are missing or if it's lost connectivity to some of the other devices and how it should behave in those circumstances. Um, and what it does, if it, if it thinks it's, if it's not got a connection, if it thinks it's missing something, is just maintain a safe baseline um, insulin rate rather than try to deliver higher doses and, in, in, you know, to manage meal consumption and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and the other one, um, and I'm just going to let the Nest Protect speak for itself on this, but there must always be a manual override. There's smoke in the master bedroom. Emergency. This alarm can't be hushed. This alarm can't be Emergency. Can't be hushed here. That video goes on for five minutes. <laughs> now, in terms of managing user issues, I seem to have un oh, skipped past this. Um, so the other thing is about really, really understanding the context of use. And this is a thing that UX people will tell you all the time. And again, it's one of those things that you know, we say so much, we, we, you know, we worry about it being a cliche. But it's obviously particularly true when you've got things that are in the world, things that are experienced as part of the world and not just kind of you know, something that's happening on a screen over here. Do you know the poopocalypse? Yeah. Um, I, I was certain someone else was going to mention that today, but you know, yes, OK. Um, so this is, a, this is a Roomba that ran over a dog poo. Um, and in its attempt to clean up the dog poo, it went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and all over the house and basically kind of bit like spread poo around this guy's entire house. Um, and iRobot have apparently admitted that this happens quite regularly. Um, so if anybody knows a good way to put a sensor onto a Roomba that can detect poo um, and cause it to stop before it's made it worse, then that would be brilliant. You should get in touch with them. But while this comes up, and this is just an example really of, of changes in real world circumstances um, that affect that your, your, your product is doing its best to do what, it, what it's supposed to do, um, but due to some unforeseen change in the real world, um, you know, actually the results are disastrous. Um, there are also some very good blog posts about things like smart locks and um, people, locks, that, locks that have inappropriately locked in open and shut positions and, and done the wrong things. I must admit I'm terrified of smart locks and I'm, I'm really not ready for one of those yet. And the other standard UX answer to all of this is, of course, you need to do user research and testing in context to understand what some of those things could be. Um, and I love this example. This is, uh, this is some guys in Singapore testing a, an Infinium drone waiter in a restaurant. Um, and apparently the conclusion of this trial so far um, is that uh, they're not quite, ready for, uh, not quite ready to have drinks flying around and food flying around above everybody's heads just yet. It's a relief. Um, the other thing is about making it worth some, back to the, the kind of ship it, steam shipping point really, is about making it worth somebody's while to keep the service running. Um, you know, it is the nature of business that, that you know, people, people won't do things unless, and, you know, unless, there's, unless there's something in it for them. And that's all right. Um, but you know, the reality, as we, we already taught, heard today, you know, is, is this, this kind of, perhaps this sort of startup kind of like rush it out type model isn't necessarily ideally suited to, to always to making physical things. Um, and, and so, you know, there, there raises all the issues of, you know, do we charge people for business models? Do we charge people subscriptions for things they're not used to paying subscriptions for? Can we convince them they want to do that? All those kinds of things to sort of try to avoid, avoid going out of business in the first place. Um, but if you do, or if you get acquired, or, you know, if priorities change, 
Um, we have to find what things we can do to, to try to make it worth somebody's while, particularly if something is a, you know, maybe if it's a, a you know, a tweeting bathroom scale, you know, okay, perhaps that's not a, a, co a coffee cup, it's not a disaster. Um, but if you're going to put, think, you know, important infrastructure in people's homes, like, you know, thermostats and stuff, um, you know, can, it, can, can we not try to find ways to make it worth someone's while to, to, keep, maintaining, to keep maintaining those things? So that might mean, you know, there are, there are projects that put source code in escrow. Maybe that it's possible to put money in escrow as well to, to, to allow somebody to support them. I, I would like to discuss that. I, you know, I think it's an important point, and, and we need to discuss the answers to that a bit more. And then finally, if something does go wrong, which it will, at least try to be kind of helpful and sensitive to people. Uh, now, you probably can't read this example. Maybe you can at the front. Uh, this is a Skybell error. Um, and this is really, really typical. And it just says, error calling Skybell. Uh, there's a problem connected to the server. Please try again later. Now, I've, I know it's hard to write error messages for connected products. I've, I've, done, I've tried to do this myself. And there's a really hard line to tread between not freaking out people who are not technical and being somewhat informative about what's, actually, about what's actually happening so they understand how long the problem might persist and whether there's anything that they can do about it. Um, so I, I'm kind of sympathetic, but you know, frankly, this, this kind of stuff just isn't, isn't really helpful to people because it makes them, feel, makes them feel powerless and not knowing what to do. Um, and then the other one is about um, interoperating products, um, and and how do we? And, and I think we're increasingly going to have to figure this out. Who who do you? Who is your frontline support if you have a problem with a product um, that might be due to a problem with somebody else's product? Uh, now this example here is this a this is a Samsung fridge, um, yay yay internet fridge cliche, um, which is having trouble connecting to Google Calendar. Um, and the reason it's having trouble connecting to Google Calendar is because Samsung programmed it to connect to a set of Google Calendar APIs that were already deprecated at the time. Um, so technically, this is kind of Samsung's fault. Um, but what happened was when people started, Samsung fridge owners started, uh, so, you know, their fridges were, were no longer connected to calendars, uh, they started phoning Samsung, who were like, well, it's nothing to do with us, that's a Google problem. Uh, and of course, Google weren't very interested either because kind of Samsung basically had screwed up and shouldn't have pointed the calendar to those APIs in the first place. Um, but, you know, I think we, we're, increasingly going, we're increasingly going to see this. People are going to have more and more products that talk to each other, that try to coordinate in various ways. If something goes wrong, which product is it? Is it, a mis is it your Wi-Fi that's misconfigured? Is it a problem with your ISP? Where, where, does, this, where does this stuff go? And this is going to be really stressful for, if we don't find some better solution to this, it's going to be really stressful for people to, to sort out for themselves. Um, in summary, a bunch of things, some of which I've talked about, some of which I haven't. Um, what I really wanted to get to was, um, as, as Finton said, I wrote a book. Um, it's been out for a year and a half now. Um, some of the examples, uh, you know, we could, you, you, some of the examples may have dated a little, but I think the fundamental principles are still pretty sound. Um, if you would like one, I have three to give away. Um, please tweet me. You can say I want a book. If you have the thing one hashtag, you get extra brownie points. Uh, and the first three of those I get will uh, will win one. Thank you very much. <laughs>